Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. My name is Margot Parmenter, and I'm the events coordinator at the Hub City Bookshop in Spartanburg, South Carolina. We're so excited to have you join us tonight for a virtual reading and conversation with debut author Marissa Ergo. This is her beautiful book right here. <laughs> Marissa's going to read, and she's welcome. Welcome, Marissa. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, and thank Thank you, Margo, for having me. So Marissa is going to tell us all about her book and all about her journey, and she's going to read a little bit. But before I hand it over to her for that, I just want to quickly introduce our bookshop for anyone who might not be familiar. The Hub City Bookshop is an independent bookstore serving upstate South Carolina. We're part of a larger organization, which is called the Hub City Writers Project. And we're a nonprofit whose mission is to cultivate readers and nurture writers of all ages. We do that by publishing original titles but also by holding writers programming, writers workshops, book clubs, and author events like this one. Many of our events and our programming are virtual, so they're worth checking out no matter where you're located. If you'd like to find out more about any of that, how we can support you as a writer, how we can um, support your maybe writerly aspirations, please go to our website, hubcity.org, and sign up for our newsletter. Also, if you haven't yet purchased your copy of The Gravity of Missing Things, please know you can click the button at the bottom of your screen and buy a brand new copy from us. Just one last thing, and I cannot emphasize this enough, please feel free to ask questions. I'm sure Marissa would be delighted to answer them, and you can use the Ask a Question button on your screen, or you can just drop your question in the chat, and we'll make sure that we get an answer for you. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our author. Marissa Argo writes young adult novels that mix humor and heart. She's a New Yorker living in Boston. By day, Marissa works in higher education. By night, she is supposed to be writing, but is mainly picking her cat up off the keyboard. The Gravity of Missing Things is her debut novel. You can follow her on Insta for book updates at Marissa Ergo Writes. Yay, welcome. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, so The Gravity of Missing Things came out a week ago on June 7th. Um, for those of you that haven't gotten a chance to read it yet, or if you haven't picked it up yet, I'm going to read a brief part of chapter one. So um, you may have read the back of the book copy, but essentially the book is from the point of view of a teenage girl after her mom is the pilot of a plane that goes missing. So we're going to start with chapter one and just read a few paragraphs. Chapter one, day zero. Everything ends. I knew that, but it didn't make it easier. I clutched the dark curtain and poked my head out ever so slightly. If you can see the audience, they can see you, which was like totally illegal in theater. You got thrown in stage crew jail if that happened. But it was the last five minutes of the fall play, maybe my last play ever. Okay, maybe not ever, but at least in high school. My family sat in the middle row, center. My older sister, Savannah, thumbed through the pamphlet, looking for my name, maybe. Next to her, my dad's eyes darted around the set, no doubt taking in the designs I'd made. It had taken me hours to paint the grand staircase they wanted for the backdrop, but I got to use the fancy acrylic paint, which costs way more than what I earned working at the local pickle store after school. Yes, we have a local pickle store. Don't ask. And my mom, wait. Where was mom? The seat next to dad was empty. Maybe they weren't sitting together. That was our new normal after all. Either way, she better get back soon. I didn't want her to miss when I took a bow. All our hard work had paid off. I wouldn't be up here without her. So that brings us to the top of page two. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. Um, so I wanna just start off with, mate, we don't wanna give anything away about what happens for people who haven't had a chance to read yet, but do you wanna just maybe give us like a brief overview of kind of what the book is about and what inspired you to write it? Sure, yeah, so the, the little excerpt that I read takes place at Violet's Play where she is working on stage crew. Um, she's designed the set and she realizes that her mom isn't there even though her mom is her biggest supporter of everything that she's done creatively. So she's really confused. And at the um, end of chapter one, not a spoiler, because it's on the back cover, um, but Violet finds out that the plane that her mom was piloting has actually completely disappeared. No wreckage, no distress signal, just completely gone. 
So the book tells the story of Violet trying to unravel the mystery of what has actually happened to this plane, what has happened to her mother. Um, she has a lot of hope and she is an eternal optimist, but everybody around her doesn't necessarily agree with her all the time. So it's really the story of her trying to bring that hope into this mystery that she unravels but while she unravels it she finds that there are maybe some more secrets that are a little bit deeper than she was expecting mm. and what inspired me to write it um i'm terrified of flying i will say that i do not like planes or anything like that um but i used to live near laguardia airport in queens and we were so close to the planes like and so it was so interesting to just watch them take off and land so close and i would just think like you know, who are those people on that plane? Like, who's flying that plane? And, and what would happen if one just disappeared? Mm -hmm. um, around that time, the MH370 missing Malaysian plane had happened. And I really just couldn't wrap my mind around the fact that a commercial airliner just disappeared. Um, so I would say those were like the two biggest inspirations for this book. Amazing. That's really interesting. Um... I love to hear about that. I love to hear that like you were you were a little scared of flying, but then you were also kind of like confronted with the realities of flying every day and that then you undertook to write this book where like the worst thing that could happen to, to somebody flying does happen. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, so we know that Violet is the protagonist. She's the main character. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe um where that character came from if she's a little bit of you a little bit of anybody you know or just you know something that you completely came up with and just imagined for the purposes of telling this story sure so i started this story with the, the idea of the plane missing but i love to write ya so this character violet just kind of like came to me and I was like, well, how does she fit in the story? Because obviously she's not flying the plane. So it just kind of, she just kind of appeared, I suppose. Um, what I like about Violet is that she's very, very optimistic throughout this entire novel, even though things are very difficult for her and things only get harder toward the end, but she keeps her optimism and she always tries to see the best in everybody. Um, I'm not really sure if we, if she's really like me. Um, some people say, who have read it so far, say that they do see the similarities. Um, I, I think that, you know, I admire her optimism um, and I think she's a little bit more naive than I was at that age, but in a, in a sweet way. Um, but we both love theater. I did high school theater as well, which is, that is a huge part of this novel that was influenced by my experience doing theater in high school and college and just how intense it can be in high school. Um, and that is something that Violet and her friends experience too, just that doing this musical feels like the most important thing in the world. Um, and it is important to Violet, even though she has other important things going on as well. I loved that this was that that was one of the settings, like one of the major settings that really like locates the story. Is it happening in theater and she's developing as a character in theater? And I loved that in the not a spoiler that it's sort of bookended with scenes of her at the theater and you can see how she kind of like grows over time. Can you speak to that a little bit just about like how the theater, you know, how her involvement with the theater kind of evolves over the course of the story. Sure. Yeah. So in the beginning of the story, Violet tells the story from backstage because she is in the stage crew, um, which she really loves to do. She also really enjoys painting, but she also is interested in acting, um, but she's a little bit nervous. She doesn't really like to sing and she can't really sing well. So she's like, well, you know, I'm not going to try out for the musical then. Um, but a lot of her friends are trying out for the musical. Her best friend wants to be Belle in the musical desperately. Um, and the boy that she's interested in is interested in auditioning as well. So she kind of thinks that, you know, maybe she could audition, but she did promise her mom that um, when she performed on stage, her mom would be there to see her. So she kind of feels this tug of war of wanting to do it, but making that promise to mom, also being a little bit scared to audition for the musical. Um, and I think that her, you know, she does have that growth of coming from someone who just wants to stay behind the curtain to someone who eventually evolves in front of it. Um, and not everyone is like that. I know amazing people who do lighting work and stage mounted and that's their thing and that's amazing. Um, but I do think a lot of young people in high schools may be just a little bit afraid to get out there and may need some encouragement. And that's what I love about high school theater, just watching the way that I changed and my friends matured and changed through high school theater. It's really, it's really amazing to see a kid really perform and have so much fun on stage yeah absolutely um i 
wonder about the other characters in the book as well. So can you give us a little synopsis of like the other, the other like sort of major characters and kind of who they are and how they come into the story? Sure. So obviously Violet's mom plays a pretty large role. They are super close. Um, Violet is also fairly close with her father, but it's pretty made, it's made clear from the beginning that Violet and her mom are really close and Violet's father and Violet's sister also have a closer relationship. So it's always been like kind of two against two in a way. Um, Savannah is Violet's older sister. She is super smart, loves school, um, has Stanford on her list of where she wants to go to school and that's her dream school and she's doing everything that she can to go to Stanford. Um, Violet's best friend is Alex, who really, really wants to be Belle in the school musical. That's the most important thing to Alex. Um, and she, you can see Alex's uh, transformation journey in this as well as auditions happen for the musical and whether she gets Belle or not. And Violet's love interest is a boy named Landon who deals with anxiety, but he's very, um, you know, not afraid to admit that he deals with anxiety and sees a therapist and lets Violet know that it's normal to do that and it's okay to do that. Um, so even though Landon is afraid and has panic attacks about auditioning, he still wants to do it and doesn't want to let that stop him. I would say those are pretty much the main characters. Um, Alex um, admits in one of the earlier chapters that she is seeing a, a secret girlfriend that she's not telling Violet about. Um, so that also becomes a source of conflict between them as well. I loved the characters. Uh, I loved the character of Landon in one of the first in one of the first scenes where we meet Landon. Um, he's knitting, which I just thought was just so lovely. And that detail comes back throughout, like throughout the other scenes in the book. Um, can you tell us how you come up with these details to help develop characters into like these fully realized people and not just like, you know, sometimes like, oh, this is the jock and this is the whatever, but like really all the characters in the novel feel like people that you could meet in real life. And that is obviously like a testament to your ability as a writer. Can you tell us how you did sure. that? Thank you so much for that compliment. I really appreciate it. Uh, I would say that kind of comes from giving your side characters goals and something that they're interested in doing. Um, all of the side characters, Savannah, Alex, and Landon, they all kind of have their own motivations and own things that they're interested in, aside from Violet. Alex is really interested in doing the musical, of course. That's kind of her main goal. Um, Landon is also interested in doing a musical, but he also has a full life and things going on. He's in a band called Thong Bong, which he admits is a terrible name. Um, so I think it's just a matter of thinking about what those characters want. Like Savannah wants to go to college in California, but is also kind of afraid of what that might mean to leave her family behind, especially, you know, among all this turmoil with her mom being missing. Um, so I think just giving characters goals and remembering that if this, if your book was real, they would be real too. So what do those people want and, you know, how can you give it to them or take it from them? Very good point. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, so switching over from like overview of characters and overview of kind of like the story to kind of like the just general conversation about like writing YA, you mentioned that that's what you love. That's where your passion is. Can you tell us more about that? How you came? Is it just that's always the genre you wanted to be in? That's just that's you like it or can you tell us kind of how you how you came on that journey? Sure. I would say that I started writing YA first. I've never really tried another age category. Um, I just find that time to be such an interesting time in a person's life when they're kind of growing up for the first time. And I think that's what I like about Violet's story is that she is really growing up and confronting a lot of adult topics while she's still a teenager and still young. And um, that's what I love about YA is like those coming of age stories that can only happen in the YA category. So yeah, it's never really occurred to me to try to write something else. I just love YA and um, I love the, the energy that teenagers have and how honest they are. Yeah, I loved that about Violet. She um, feels super relatable. She feels um, super, as you said, like the optimism is really just like coming through even as all of these you know, adult issues are thrown at her. And there are a lot of things. I mean, um, Entangled Teen did this really, really cool thing where it basically they kind of 
sort of it's sort of like a trigger warning but just to like let you know about the things that are going to come up and it spans a lot of issues grief um you know sexuality um self-harm racial profiling like there are a lot of issues can you tell us kind of maybe about a few of the things and why you chose to include them and kind of how you ended up including them and addressing them in the book sure so yeah, so if you go to the back of the book in the front, there is a little message telling you if you are interested in the content warnings to go to the back. Um, I know that sometimes content warnings, um, people have like mixed feelings about them. Personally, I feel pretty strongly about them. I would never want someone to go into this book and not you know, see something that was upsetting or trigger them. So that's why we chose to include them on the back. Um, the, the reasons that I you know included those is like I said, I don't want people to be like taken aback. Um, trying to think of a few. I mean, grief is something that so many teenagers do experience. And I think just how to handle something like Violet's mom being missing is such a difficult thing. So I think that's what really interested me in the story. Like how does someone so young get through something like that? And how does her family and friends like rally around her? So showing that she has a support system that they're certainly not perfect. Her dad, her sister, her best friend they're not perfect but they are there for her whether she can see it right away or not so that was certainly one of the things i wanted to address um another was that you know growing up you know when i was reading young adult i didn't really read young adult books that much because i didn't feel like there were characters that i could relate to or it always just felt like either the stories were trying to teach me a lesson or it was like twilight and no disrespect to twilight it's just not my thing i don't like vampires totally respect Twilight though. Um, so yeah, so I just kind of felt like YA at the time, there just wasn't like a huge selection for people looking for like authentic stories, but it's amazing how much YA has grown in the past years. Like it has just become really, really spectacular. And there are so many authors who have paved the way for that. So I think including, you know, characters who are maybe not struggling with their sexuality, but they're queer and they're mentioning it and they're proud of it. That was just not something that you saw a long time ago. So it was important for me to make sure that that was in the novel. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I, you know, it's, I love how it's just like, and this is a thing and, and there's no, it's, it does, it's, there's no, yes, as you said, I'm not being very articulate. As you said, um, there was so much of this, like, it's a lesson or there were all these tropes. And this is just a story about people who, ha you know, I think that's what, one of the things that I really, really loved. It's just like, these are, these are people because, like teenagers are people you know and yeah. and we're just reading the story about them it's part of the story it's not like the whole story is like one topic or grief or you know there's a lot of things going on there's romance there's the mystery there's you know growth there's just like your everyday stress of being a teenager and it really gives us like well-rounded full picture but talking about the processing of grief i loved um the detail about her dad like going to get a book and mm -hmm. the book about how and he he constantly is sort of referencing back to this book of like this is i and i just thought that was lovely um to show as you said the support system of you know no one's perfect but the people are around kind of exactly. helping and doing doing yeah. the best they can exactly the dad is not perfect by any means but he really is doing the best he can for his daughters yeah um okay let's see there was something else that had come up in what you were just responding to oh can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the some of the particular authors and some of the particular books that you felt kind of like paved the way in YA or that like kind of maybe inspired you in particular when sure. you were, yeah, when you were starting your career? So I started reading YA probably when I started writing, which was like six or seven years ago. So I kind of started reading authors that had been published six years ago, but also authors before that to get a sense of like understanding the genre that I was going to write in and what the storytelling is there. Um, I'm a huge fan of Julie Murphy. When I read Dumplin' for the first time, I was like, wow, like that is the kind of book that I want to write. Um, same with Karen Thompson Walker or Karen Walker Thompson, um, The Age of Miracles. That was something that really inspired me. Um, those are two books that like, even though they inspired me, they don't necessarily reflect in this novel at all. But those are two books that definitely got me interested in writing YA. 
Um, one of the things that I also thought was very maybe contemporary or very like modern about this novel was the way it really contends with kind of the realities of living in a social media saturated sort of one of the first things that kind of happens and that's even on the back cover is that once this news gets out that the plane has disappeared, everyone in the internet sphere is kind of chiming in with their comments on Reddit, on various message boards, on, and you sort of see it throughout the novel that, you know, that having to contend with like all these voices online that I will be dating myself by admitting that, but that I didn't have to contend with when I was a teenager. Like they, it wasn't so ever present, all of this like commentary coming in. Can you talk about that a little bit as like a theme in the novel and as maybe just a reality for your characters? Yeah, I mean, definitely dating myself as well. I did not have to deal with any of that at the time. And I'm so glad that I didn't. I mean, I just, I feel for these kids that I sometimes feel like they're not allowed to make mistakes because everything is on the internet forever. And, you know, you learn so much at that age. And, you know, looking back at yourself and cringing is kind of a good thing because that means that you've grown and you've learned. So for Violet, a big painful part of the story is that everybody has an opinion because it's such a public thing that happened. Everybody's speculating. And when things like this happen, people tend to forget that like there are human beings involved. Like I, I went back and I read a lot of um, news articles, of course, while I was doing research about plane crashes and the comments are, are just awful. Like people just forget that these are human beings. And I just was trying to get into what that must have felt like for Violet already struggling with this huge problem of her mom being missing, but then having to hear everybody's opinions about it online and not really being able to escape, but also having the media literally outside her house because of this 24 seven news cycle that we're all living in now. So yeah. Yeah, that is a huge, huge part of the novel as well. Um. I also think there's like maybe a flip side where you like she's able to kind of do a lot of sleuthing and do like at sh find these clues and kind of maybe more because she has access to the internet and ac you know and all of these like all the information that's around us so it's sort of a double edged sword because it does seem like okay it helps a little bit in the sleuthing I don't know if you can talk at all about kind of like how, how much you can say without revealing anything about kind of the adventure she goes on to find more information. Um, but I thought it was it was cool to see, okay, well there's flip side because she can use this information to go. She feels empowered to kind of solve this mystery um, in a way that maybe characters wouldn't who didn't have access to the information you know sphere of the internet. Yeah, so true. I mean, going back to some of the things we said earlier, I think one of the most frustrating things about being a teenager is feeling like you have the energy and you just want to do all these different things, but you're so limited. You, you just can't do things. You aren't able to like leave your house at a certain time without your parents asking you or, you know, there's a lot of restriction and limits on you when you're a kid, even though you feel like you're ready to do everything. Um, so I definitely think that was a part of Violet's frustration as well. If she could have hopped on a plane and like circled the ocean, she would have done it, but she could. not um, So I think, yeah, like you said, all that internet something like she was able to kind of put some pieces together to go find people that she wouldn't have known that they existed before, leading her to different clues as to her mother's past and what actually happened. So I do think that the internet does give a benefit in terms of connection in that way. If it's kind of hard to be completely invisible online, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So Violet used that to her advantage to find people from her mom's past that she thought would help her to solve the mystery. Mm -hmm. And I actually did a lot of um, interesting research going on that. So I actually was able to talk to the FBI. I talked to an FBI agent wow. um, who was so cool. And I'm still really surprised that they were actually able to talk to me. <laughs> um, so cool. Yeah, they have um, a department that talks to authors or people making TV or you know media and things like that. So. They were actually able to help me, you know, of course they couldn't talk about what it was like, what it would be like to look for a missing plane or um, any details or anything like that. But they were able to help me understand the FBI agent character a little bit better and certain things that would be allowed or not allowed. Like, for example, I did ask if it would be okay for the FBI agent character to work on this case, even though her friend was on the plane. Um, I wanted to make sure that that was okay. And they said that it was, as long as it's not a family member. I wondered about that. Yeah. That's <laughs> they so interesting. Was, yeah, I was surprised by that too, honestly. I would think a close friend would kind of bar you from that investigation. But 
Um, and I'm sure it's different for every case that they investigate, but he said that that would be um, okay. Um, and same for, I wanted to make sure that the FBI agent would be okay to drive Violet home. There's a part where, no spoilers, but she kind of runs into Violet and she drives her home. Um, and they said that that would be okay too. Not a usual thing, but it would be okay. So yeah, it was really interesting to just get some um, interest, you know, some ideas of what their day would be like. Yeah, that is so fascinating. That's so cool to hear kind of about the research and the, the all the kind of investigation that you did as background. Were there any other, like, can you talk about any other kinds of research that you did in your process of writing the novel? Yeah, absolutely. I did a ton of research for this because, like I said, I am really afraid of planes and I really don't fly that often. But I watched a lot of videos, a lot of documentaries about plane crashes, about planes in general, how they work, um, what it's like to be a pilot, which I really learned a lot about because I really had no idea. Um, so I learned a lot about that, which that research kind of informed some of the book because I didn't know that it's very, very expensive to become a commercial pilot. So a lot of them go through the military. So, and Violet's mom was in the military. Um, so that research informed some of what I wrote just so I would make it realistic. Um, and we ended up having a huge part uh, in the plot. Mm -hmm. So yes, lots of documentaries about flying, which definitely reassured me that flying is very safe. So I felt good about that, but I was still very nervous on the last flight that I went on recently. Um, but it is very safe. So I just kept trying to remind myself of that, everything that I learned. But I learned a lot about the pieces of a plane, how they work, um, you know, what would happen if, you know, X happened, then how would that affect Y on the plane, that sort of thing. Mm, very, very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think there was a lot of, and all felt very real and very believable in terms of the, like, just logistical details about the, like, it going dark and what happens when the, the, black box and stuff like that. I feel like it's one of those things where we've heard stories about it enough that it feels very believable, very real. And then Violet has a little bit of, she kind of, it feels as if she's sort of on this quest where she, she meets some people through her kind of detective work, if you would call it that, that she does. She meets some people who kind of give credence to the narrative that it could be like slightly conspiracy-ish that other people in her life are sort of saying, you know, we're worried about you. Um, but there are also like people in the, there's like some credence, some reality given to that, like to those theories that perhaps the government is involved and things like that. Did you do research on kind of like government conspiracy too? Oh yeah. And it, as I started to do research on, you know, missing planes or uh, planes that had crashed, there's always, you know, people saying, oh, it's related to this government. Like, people are always going to find a conspiracy theory for things. But um, again, no spoilers, but in one of the chapters with Miles Miller, who is someone that Violet finds on her way, who is someone who knew her mom in the past, um, he talks a lot about conspiracy theories and how this could potentially be a um, remote hijacking, which sounds like it's something that couldn't happen, but it actually, like, very well can and everything that he says in the novel actually happened. Like it's all research that um, I looked up. So th there is certainly part of conspiracy theories that, you know, there may be like a kernel of truth to some of them. So yes, I did a lot of research on where those come from and how they ar arrive and things like that. Can I ask just kind of about your, some of your favorite scenes in the novel or favorite details or you know any of those things that really um because I know when you're writing you get into it and then there's there's such a process and then there's a process of editing and then you see it out in the world or are there some parts that you're just like oh I really you know I worked on this a lot and I reworked it a lot and now I'm really attached or anything that you just like loved from the start like the first time you wrote it hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely love the high school theater aspect of it. Um, and in my first edit, Violet was someone who just wanted to stay backstage. She was happy to be stage crew because a lot of people, like I said, that they are like, that's their passion is either stage crew or stage managing or lighting design or what have you. There's so many amazing paths to a theater career that don't involve being on stage. Um, but as the story went on, it just kind of felt like she was hiding something from herself by not letting her just audition and just have fun and you know be involved in the musical so that changed so I was glad that I made that change because being in the high school theater world is just 
it's just such a fun and like insane time at the same time. Um, so I wanted to make sure I accurately portrayed like how serious it is to be in a high school musical when you're in high school. So that was um, something I really enjoyed writing. I also really enjoy the scene where Violet and Savannah finally have their confrontation because as I mentioned earlier, it's always kind of been Violet and mom on one side and dad and Savannah on the other side. And with mom gone, that um, square is kind of a triangle now. So Violet and Savannah just get into a fight and push each other in the backyard. And I don't have siblings, but I feel like that is a very big sibling moment of finally just like pushing your sister because she's really annoying. <laughs> I loved that scene too. And I thought it was, um, I thought it was quite, you know, you see it build up and then you see them over the course of the book kind of, yeah, form their own dyad. They form their own partnership and they kind of become siblings through some, you know, through some tri tribulation that happens and through some things that happen, they kind of come closer together um, yeah. and have the moment of like real support and real like, you know, partnership with each other. And that was definitely fun to see. Can I ask why you chose Beauty and the Beast as the, <laughs> as the production they're working yeah. on? So it's kind of a funny story. So I was in Beauty and the Beast in high school. Um, and I was a fork, by the way. <laughs> but um, When I was drafting, so I'm the kind of person that I write really fast. Um, and it all just kind of, you know, how some people are plotters and some people are pantsers, they call them. Um, people who either plot the whole novel, write an outline, or people who just say, okay, I have an idea and I'm just gonna go. I'm kind of in between, but maybe a little bit more on the pantser side. So when I write, I just wanna get it done and then I'll go back and make edits. So I never really intended to have Beauty and the Beast in the final cut there. I was always just using it and then I figured I'll replace it with a different musical and I'll think a little bit more about it. I just wanna write it, but then someone who read it, um, a close friend, one of the first readers was like, I love how you use Beauty and the Beast to bring out the themes of identity and realizing who you are and transformation because it reflects Violet's journey. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of unintentional, but I think it serves the story well. And it served my writing well because I knew it easily. So I could just kind of, you know, rattle off the details. Yeah. I think I want to jump to what you were saying about the theme of identity and kind of discovering oneself and finding out who you are because it's a clear theme and such a beautiful theme in this book. Um, can you speak a little bit to, I loved to the, the tagline, which is behind every secret is an even bigger lie. And I think that theme of kind of uncovering or discovering identity is universal um although like not all not all people will go through such the amount of things that violet has to contend with can you talk a little bit about kind of how that theme appears in the book and how important it was to you as a writer to sort of include that and convey it with your characters and with your plot sure I think whenever you read a young adult novel, one of the questions that the characters will grapple with is who am I? Because I think when you're a teenager at that age, like you are just trying to figure out who you are and how you fit in this world. So I think that's a universal theme for everybody. Um, for Violet, there are some particular things that make her really question her identity. Now that her family is kind of splitting apart, um, she you know, starts off with, um, her and her sister are not really in a, they don't really have a great relationship, but that changes. Um, there's just so many different things that like force her to ask, like, who am I if I don't have my mom? Or who am I if I don't do stage crew anymore? So there's so many like different questions that I think kind of force her to really not just decide who she is, but, but figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, I wonder if there's anything I'm missing about the book or, you know, something that's like obvious that you're like, this is something people want to know that you really should have asked about. I'm trying to think. I mean, I feel like you covered it. Usually people ask me about YA. Um, a lot of people asked, a lot of the teens that I have worked with in the past asked me, um, I don't want to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't read it, but um, the characters, if, if Violet or whoever she ends up with, um, if they stay together, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, in terms of like writing, um, we can certainly talk about that. 
Um, I'm, like I said, I'm kind of in between like a panther and a, a plotter, but definitely more toward a panther. And it just kind of like flows. A lot of the big things in this music, in this book, I didn't really plan on writing. I just kind of knew that the plane was going to disappear and Violet was going to do theater. And then I just kind of went from there. So a lot of the big plot points were not really creepy. So did you, did they, did you feel like they came from the character? Like that, that you started to write Violet and you start, like you had the idea, you started to write it and then that it sort of grew organically from what you already had on the page? Yeah, I, I have to say like, I found Violet's voice really easily when I first started writing this. The first, I think it's the first three chapters um, are pretty much straight up from my first draft. Like they really haven't changed at all. Uh, and I think that's just because Violet came to me like really clearly and it felt really clear what she wanted and what was going on. So sometimes when I write, I feel like the characters just kind of take me on their own path, which is why when people say like, oh, after the book, would so-and-so do this? Or what would so-and-so do when they grow up? Like, I feel like they, like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I feel like the characters kind of have a mind of their own. Yeah. Um, and they just like, tell me where the story wants to go. Can you tell us about your process in terms of like the logistics of it in the bio? I think you said, you know, you have a day job and you work by night. So what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you have like a word goal that you're trying to reach? Or are you just trying to sit down or do you miss your characters during the day and want to go hang out with them? Yeah, I definitely miss them and definitely want to like spend time with them as weird as that sounds. Mm -hmm. um, my process definitely revolves around my full-time job because most writers do have a full-time job. Everybody that I know who publishes books does you know, have a full-time gig. So I would say I, I do try to write like a thousand words a day, but I'm also very forgiving with myself be because that doesn't always happen. Um, luckily I find writing fun and I enjoy writing, but sometimes it just doesn't happen and, and that's okay. I definitely, I'm always thinking about writing though, even when I'm not writing. And to me that counts as writing because <laughs> you're thinking about your plots or going on a walk and thinking about it. Um, I would say my Writing style has kind of changed recently because I just finished graduate school, um, which I started during the pandemic. So that kind of was hard to juggle a full-time job and graduate school. So writing kind of had to take a back seat for a bit. So I'm finally getting back into it and finding, um, finding my way again. So this time I'm trying to plot a little bit more um, so that I can try to use like the beats that you have to do as a writer, not have to, but um, suggested storyline beats to match up with act one, two, and three. So I'm trying, trying to get out of my pantsing ways, but at the same time, I don't want to miss out on what the characters reveal to me as I just kind of like free write. Mm. Can you tell us, I want to make sure this question gets answered. There's a question from um, an, an audience member. I love Violet's voice. I wish I could help her if she tries to discover the mystery. Speaking of help, what advice would you give your younger writing self? Oh, thank you so much. I really like Violet's voice as well. I, like I said, I, I love her optimism. Um, what would I give my younger writing self? That's a great question. So I started writing probably like six or seven years ago when I was fresh out of college. Um, I would say that I was always having fun with it because like what I would tell other people is have fun with it, but I always have fun. Um, I would say like most of my family and friends didn't know that I was writing until my book was announced. I was very, very shy about it. And I, because I was afraid that nothing would come of it. So I wrote three books before this one actually, and those will never see the light of day but um they helped me grow as a writer but i just never talked about them because i was like embarrassed that like i knew that they weren't published worthy or they weren't going anywhere so um i i wish that i had told more people and that i wasn't embarrassed that i was trying something new and that i was just trying to learn um i also wish that i had gone to more like networking things like what you have the hub city connection sounds amazing like i wish that i had done more things like that I would go to a few things, but I would only go once and like never come back because I was like afraid or nervous, like that people were like really good or already published. So I think my advice would just be like, you know, there's nothing wrong with trying something new and being new to writing and just keep going and have fun with it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And if there's anyone listening, um, we have all kinds of stuff. We have writers groups where you can literally just come and we have what we call like open writing sessions that happen over Zoom. And so it's literally just like come show up a way to be accountable for yourself to like make sure you, you know, spend 30 minutes writing. We have everything from that to like more like little lectures on craft, little like lectures from our press side on what publishing looks like, what finding an agent looks like, stuff like that, that I think um, if you're listening and you're interested can be really helpful just to like know, and it's all free. You can just come to the Zooms. Um, and then we also have like, you know, the in-person type of like writers workshops and writers um, events, but the Zoom ones are really great. And even just something as small as like having um, a writer's group of like other people who are, do you have a writer's group or do you, do you, so, yeah. Kind of. So a few years ago, like that was one good thing that I did early in my writing career was find that group of people. I was on this website um, called Scribbafile where I found like a group of critique partners because I didn't know any groups like locally that were meeting or I didn't hear of anything. So I went online and I found them and that really, really changed my writing a lot to have other people because writing is such a, a siloed activity or by yourself, you know? So when you finally have some feedback and have other people looking at the whole thing, that just made a huge difference. Um, so I'm glad that I did that early. So I recommend finding your group. Um, and I do have, so I haven't really shared my work with that group anymore because I've with grad school and everything it's been very difficult but I do have a group of writer friends that we don't necessarily like share work with each other but we hold each other accountable and we just talk about things and help each other through the publishing process because it could be very very lonely to deal with it and so much of publishing is rejection before you get there and you definitely need people to help you with that because it can be very lonely. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to to publishing and kind of what that looked like and maybe like the broad strokes. Cause I think that the idea there's like, it's intimidating if you're like a beginning writer or it's intimidating the idea of like, okay, first I have to finish a whole book. I have to finish this entire draft. And then if it's good, I have to then like try to find an agent or try, you know, can you tell us like maybe a little bit about what your path looked like? Sure. Yeah. So my path to publishing was not easy. Um, I wrote three books before this one, um, and it was it was rough. There's just so much rejection out there, and um, I'm trying to think of what would be most helpful. So yeah, it, it was definitely rough, but finding those people I think help you and realizing that okay, so my first three books, you know, they just they weren't publishing worthy because they they just weren't speaking what I wanted them to speak. And I was still developing my craft and learning. So I don't regret that because they helped me grow. So I think sometimes, even myself, I feel this pressure of like, oh, I need the writing that I make to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect because everything that you do, you'll, you know, you'll get there eventually. Um, and it really honestly wasn't even that easy with this one either. Um, thankfully, I did end up getting that yes from my agent, from my publisher, and obviously that was life changing. Um, but I am definitely someone who knows the struggle um, of getting there. It is not easy, but publishing is very worth it. And if you just keep writing because you love it, then you'll find that it is absolutely worth all the rejections. What's been the most unexpected thing that's happened since you kind of became a published mm -hmm. author? What's been the uh -huh. most unexpected thing? I don't know if it's unexpected necessarily. It all just kind of feels surreal to me that like strangers have read my book. And I think that's amazing. Um, it's just, I'm so grateful for every single person who reads my book or leaves a review on Goodreads or Amazon, or it's just like amazing to me that people do that. And I, I truly do appreciate it because like I said, I am someone who I climbed that publishing mountain. It was not easy. Um, so I, it really does mean a lot to me. Um, another unexpected part is I didn't realize how weird it would be that these characters only existed in my head. Like I wrote this book in 2018 and it got accepted for publication in 2020. Mm -hmm. So these characters only existed like in my head for a very long time. So then to hear my friends and my family start and you would say like Violet, I'm like, what? Like it's like weird sometimes, but in a good way. Yeah, now they're out in the world. You've like unleashed them. 
into the world. Um, so then comes the natural next question. Will we see more from these characters maybe in a future book? Or mm-hmm. are you, I know you said you're finishing up school. So that sounds like a lot. Are you, are you working on different story or, you know, no pressure? <laughs> um, as for these characters, I can't say no. Um, Cause you never know what will happen. I do feel like their story is it feels complete to me I feel like they're at a place where I felt comfortable leaving them that they're all happy and have you know what they need in life and like I feel confident that they'll they'll be okay um so I can't say you know no to that because you never know what will happen um but I don't plan on writing a sequel or anything like that but again you never know things happen um, as far as writing other books, I certainly want to stay within the YA category. I just love young adult. So I am working on a couple different YA contemporaries at the moment. As soon as school finished, I threw all my textbooks away and started writing again. So <laughs> thankfully, I have, I'm have i getting my writing brain back. So I hope that you guys will see another Marissa Ergo novel fairly soon. Absolutely. We also hope that. Um, We definitely hope that because this one was wonderful and can't wait to see sort of how your career develops from here. Um, Is there anything that anybody in the audience didn't get a chance to ask, wanted to ask, don't be shy? Um, We've covered advice for young writers. Is there anything that... um, maybe you would say okay if you're in high school right now i i guess i'm going to ask a two-part question if for anyone who's in high school now or who's a young adult now what advice do you have um for them if they want to be a writer if they want to become a published author eventually and then what advice do you have for them just like for life for like surviving (laughs) surviving high school yeah great question um i suppose my writing advice would just be have fun like when i was in high school i wrote all the time and i never really like i always like wanted to be an author but i never wrote with the intention of getting anything published and i didn't think it would necessarily be something that happened until i was like 21. um so when i was in high school i just wrote because it was fun so if you enjoy writing like keep doing it don't feel like you need to say, oh, I need to write 500 words a day or like, don't, you know, put that pressure on yourself unless you feel like it helps you. But when you're a teenager, you have so much going on in your life that, you know, just do what you enjoy. Um, Read books that you enjoy. Don't feel like you need to read certain things. I spent a lot of time when I was that age feeling like, oh, if I want to write, then I need to read the classics or blah, blah, blah. Like read what's contemporary, read what you have fun reading and read what you want to write. And that would be my advice for writing as well like just write the book that you want to read i feel like that's what i did with this one as well because i definitely look for books about planes missing planes and i couldn't find any so definitely write what you enjoy and in terms of tips for surviving high school be gentle on yourself it's gonna be okay if i could tell myself one thing from high school it would be chill like i was (laughs) very since i was a, a nerdy theater kid i did share some of alex's like uh neuroticism about the play and making sure everything is perfect and everything has to be perfect it does not just have fun relax everything's gonna be okay i'm gonna put those in the chat because they're both really good (laughs) thanks i definitely had no chill when i was in high school i had to did not have any chill. I was so anxious about everything all the time. And actually, this reminds me of one thing I did want to want to ask you about, which is that in the book, there are a couple of references to kind of, I think it was a scene that I really loved early on when um, right after Violet's mom goes missing, the FBI comes and asks her dad, uh, was she depressed? You know, was she, is there any, is there any evidence to support that she might have you know, taken the plane down. And he sort of says, well, of course she was depressed. Everyone is depressed because like the ice caps are melting and the economy is failing and like everything is a disaster, right? And I thought, oh my gosh, that is a reality that like many, that like, you know, young adults today are growing up in sort of that as their reality. Can you speak to that a little bit as sort of like how that, you know, the, the choice to include it like very explicitly and then what it, how it maybe informed the rest of the book. 
Sure, yeah. I think when I was younger and reading books in high school, none of them really tackled depression or anxiety. Like mental health just wasn't talked about the way that it was talked about today. If you said that you saw a therapist or you had depressed feelings, people were like, what? Like it just wasn't the same and people tried to sweep it under the rug or they didn't know how to handle you if you were anything but pretending to be happy. If It was just very a different time. <laughs> so I think we've come a long way in terms of mental health and I think just like addressing it that mental health is an issue now and it's something that, you know, people struggle with, especially teenagers and there's nothing wrong with admitting that. So I think having the dad mention that and like bringing up mental health explicitly is definitely something that was important to me. Also, I think maybe it just bears mentioning that this is um, an inclusive book. There are LGBT plus characters. It is Pride Month. Um, and we do know, I think that, um, you know, this is, we, we, this is potentially an intersection with mental health issues, like with, you know, and with society and mental health issues and just like, celebrating being LGBT plus. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, that was very important to me to have queer representation in this novel. Because again, when I was young, there was none. So it's, it's come such a long way. And I think that's amazing. And everybody should be proud of who they are. I love that Violet is proud of who she is. She and she doesn't say that there's no struggles with it. She admits that sometimes being bisexual can feel very confusing when people are like, Oh, you're really gay, or you're really straight. And so you know, there are people that will say things like that. So she's aware of it. But at the same time, she is very proud of who she is. And then you have some characters without spoiling anything, who maybe aren't 100% sure what they identify as or don't want to use labels. And that's okay, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, one last question to leave with. Are there any books right now that you're loving or books that you are reading that you want to recommend that you want to make sure the audience hears about? Sure. So I may I let myself buy a book or two from every independent bookstore that I went to on my debut day. So I ended up with like a stack of books, which was so fun and awesome. So exciting. So, yeah, it was awesome. So I just started reading Home Field Advantage by Dahlia Adler, and it is so good. It is absolutely one of those books that makes me like want to write. So I definitely recommend that one. Home it just Field came out Advantage. June 7th, Home Field Advantage. It's a YA, YA contemporary about um, a young cheerleader who the quarterback of her team gets replaced with a girl quarterback on the football team. So it's a, it's pretty interesting. I really like it so far. Cool. That sounds really fun. And it sounds like you have um, a stacked TBR to take yes. you through. I am um, not allowed to buy any more um, books and I'm not allowed to go to the library for like two months. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, but everybody here who needs a copy of The Gravity of Missing Things, please do not be shy. Um, go and pick one up for yourself. Use the button to buy from us or go to the library. Just make sure you get your hands on this really, really wonderful book. Marissa, thank you so much for joining us, for being here. It was so lovely to be in conversation with you and congratulations again um, you. on getting your book into the world. We are so happy that it's in the world because I love these characters and it was so nice to meet them. That really means a lot. Thank you so much for having me today and for all the kind words and thank you to everybody who joined us today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I just want to remind everybody who's listening that this is going to be, um, it will continue to live here at crowdcast.io slash e slash Marissa Ergo Hub City. So if you want to share with anybody who wasn't able to be here, you can share the recording with them and introduce them to this book. So thanks everyone for being yeah. here. Thank thanks you so much. Us. It really means a lot. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Margo. Thank you. Bye.